So I'm going to take you to the hypothesis of the back of this book. I have a description. Go into the description. Uh, I have another video where I did the introduction of this fascinating book that takes you into the world of the psychopath. They're existing in, in our environments today in, in all communities and all demographics, racial backgrounds, ethnic groups. I'm noticing this trace of the psychopath. It's being hidden. The affect of it is being normalized in our society. Um, but they're blocked off, disassociated, and misattuned from the bank of their emotions. And I'm so worried that this is turning, it's fueling their aggressions and their lack of empathy for other human beings, which has turned them demonic and dark to where they can now rape, kill us, not value us not want us to even grow and heal evolve so it's an evolutionary lag that's happening due to the i guess way the brain has been functioning in the man that for the most part has control and dominance over our society but we got to go back to the man and try to reason with him to look at his mind a little differently by going the clinical route I'm going to take you out into some interpretations. Of, I'm not going to take you into the actual case studies, but I'm going to take you into the basic hypothesis of what's wrong with these patients as we're now looking at this narcissist in our society, asking ourselves what's wrong with this man, okay? So I'm going to try, try to read this very slowly. I don't know how long it's going to take me. As long as I got energy, I'm going to keep reading and try to make up some, some sense of all of this, okay? in a clinical sense of what's wrong with the patient of the psychopath. Now that we have proceeded with our task through the stages of one, presenting observations of the gross material and two, sifting and tabulating as convincingly and intelligibly as we were able to pertinent residues of our data, let us attempt to the next step. This will consist in searching for some concepts or formulating some theories that might satisfactorily account for the facts observed in those case studies. Much of our material appears contradictory, not only in the ordinary world of average or normal living, but even in the world of mental disorders commonly granted to be less readily comprehensible in terms of ordinary reason. Even the accepted postulates, which helps us come to some understanding of the hysterical case or the delusional schizophrenic seems at first to fail when applied to the psych psychopathic personality. A patient whose fragmented ego prevents him from becoming aware of significant facts and puts him at, a mer at the mercy of fantasies indistinguishable from what is real may conduct himself in a fashion that strikes us as altogether absurd and irrational if we fail to take into consideration this fragmentation. A man sane by the standards of psychiatry, aware of all the facts which we ourselves recognize and free from delusions, who conducts himself in a way quite as absurd as anything found among the psychotics becomes another problem altogether. One finds himself confronted with a paradox within the already baffling domain of mental disorder. In the attempt to arrive at an applicable conception, one consistent with the facts of our observations, I find it necessary, first of all, to postulate that the psychopath has a genuine and often very serious disability. To say that he is merely queer or perverse or in some borderline state within health and illness does little or nothing to account for the sort of behavior he demonstrates objectively and obviously. The practice, quite popular until the last few years, of classifying these patients, no matter how plain their incapacity to lead normal lives, as one, no nervous or mental disease, and two, psychopathic personality, whatever the sanction afforded by tradition, emerges not only as an error, but also as an absurdity when we honestly examine the material in which such terms apply. 
Let us for a moment consider the essential evidence brought out in staff meetings on which experienced psychiatrists established in an obvious case the diagnosis of schizophrenia on which legal action is taken to declare the patient psychotic and incompetent, insane, incompetent, and commit him for treatment. In the brief summarizing statement to support such opinions, we found often found such words as these. Unquote. The history shows that he has failed repeatedly to make a satisfactory adjustment to the social group. His actions indicate serious impairment of judgment and show that he cannot be relied upon to conduct himself with ordinary regard for the safety of himself or others. His injudious and unacceptable behavior has, furthermore, occurred without normal or adequate motivation. He shows no real insight into his condition and tends often to project the sources of his troubles to the environment. His emotional reactions are grossly impaired, and he has repeatedly shown inappropriate or inadequate effects. We may say then that he is psychotic, incompetent, and incapable of carrying on the usual activities of life and in need of close supervision. End quote. This was a an assessment made by the psychiatrist given to a case study client patient with schizophrenia. His emotional reactions are grossly impaired and he shows inappropriate and inadequate affects, though he commits these injudious and unaccessible behaviors without normal motivations or adequate motivations. This is the schizophrenic. This is how they was able to diagnose this back, this diagnosis of a schizophrenic patient uh, back in that time period. Such facts have often constituted more convincing evidence for diagnoses of schizophrenia than even the delusions and hallucinations also frequently pre present, but sometimes not demonstrable in that psychosis. So just by him doing the injudious and unacceptable behaviors was much more of a stronger evidence than the delusions and hallucinations demonstrated in that psychosis. Can y'all see? But this gets masked in the psychopath because he's not schizophrenic. On paper. All of these statements just recorded, we may apply with full validity to the psychopath. You see what I've just said? So you can just apply all of these statements to the psychopath so they're able to exist and be normalized and hide within the fabric of our society. This of course does not make him a case of schizophrenia, but does, it is now maintained afford grounds for saying that he has a grave psychiatric disorder and grounds that cannot be dismissed lightly. Though we insist on the gravity of his disorder, we frankly admit that it is a different kind of disorder from all those now recognized as serious impair, uh, impairing competencies. So I guess because it's not listed so strongly in the DSM-5 as a definite psychiatric disorder, it, it is not classified or recognized as a seriously impairing competency because he can still function and work and things of this nature. But it is a disorder that differs more widely in its general features from any of those that they differ from one another. The first and the most striking difference is this. In all the orthodox psychoses one finds, I guess that those are those evidence-based disorders that they've clinically put in this DSM-5, they call them the orthodox psychoses, like your more generalized, you know what I mean, but you got bipolar, definite schizophrenia, bipolar one, bipolar two, schizophrenia, 
uh, mania. These are all orthodox. These orthodox psychoses one finds in addition to the criteria mentioned or to some of the criteria mentioned, a more or less obvious alteration of reasoning processes or of some other demonstrable personality feature. In the psychopath, one does not see this. One is confronted with a convincing mask of sanity. Sanity. All the outward features of this mask are intact. It cannot be displaced or penetrated by questions directed toward deeper personality levels. One never hits upon the chaos sometimes find on searching beneath the outer surface of a paranoid schizophrenic. The thought processes retain their normal aspects under psychiatric investigation and in technical tests designed to bring one obscure evidence of derangement. One finds not merely an ordinary two-dimensional mass, but what seems to be a solid and substantial structural image of the sane and rational personality. He is then, in a full literal sense, an example of Trelat's expressive turn. Furthermore, this personality structure is, in all theoretical situations, functions in a manner of apparently identical with that of normal sane functionings. Logical thought processes may be seen in perfect operation, no matter how they are stimulated or treated under experimental conditionings. Furthermore, one usually finds verbal and facial expressions, tones of voice, and all the other signs we have come to regard as implying conviction and emotion and the normal experiencing of life as we know it ourselves and as we assume it to be in others. Only very slowly and by a complex estimation or judgment based on to tooting the small impressions does the conviction come upon us that Despite these intact rational processes and their consistent application in all directions, we are dealing here not with a complete man at all, but with something that suggests subtly structured reflex machines, which can mimic the human personality perfectly. This is interesting. We are dealing here not with a complete man at all, but with something that suggests a subtly constructed reflex machine which is social conditioning, which can mimic the human personality perfectly. So this is an atomized robot. He's basically talking about a perfect slave right now. That's just merely mimicking human personalities. <laughs> a reflex machine. <laughs> but it's still a psychopath. This smoothly operating psychotic apparatus not only reproduces consistently specimens of good human reasonings <laughs> like civility and proper decorum, but also appropriate stimulations of normal human emotions like empathy. Oh my God, he just got hit by a car. Somebody call the cops. He's in a panic as he's lighting up a cigarette and going by his day. <laughs> So perfect is this reproduction of a whole and normal man that no one who examines him can point out in scientific or objective terms why he is not real. And yet one knows or feels he knows that reality in the sense of full healthy experiencings of experiencing of life is not here. And this is what I'm trying to figure out about this man. Is he in contact with his emotions? With the bank of his consciousness, is he real? Is he is an automized robot? Is he a hieronoid? <laughs> no, is he real? Hello, hi, hello, man. Are you real? Blink twice for yes. <laughs> Thank you.
Don't get distracted, Cornelius. Fortunately, for the purpose of this discussion, but unfortunately, indeed, in other light, an objective demonstration is available which coincides perfectly with our slowly emerging impression. The psychopath, however, perfectly he mimics man theoretically, that is to say, when he speaks for himself in words, and words fails altogether when he is put into the practice of actual living. His failure is so complete and so dramatic that it is difficult to see how such a failure could be achieved by anything less than a downright madman or by one totally or almost totally unable to grasp emotionally the major competence of meaning or feeling implicit in the thoughts of which he expresses all the experiences he appears to go through. <laughs> oh my God. Let me repeat this. His failure is so complete and so dramatic that it is difficult to see how such a failure could be achieved by anything less than a downright madman or, a, or by one totally or almost totally unable to grasp emotionally the major components of meaning or feeling implicit to the thoughts which he expresses like i love you honey <laughs> or the experiences he appears to go through as he's cheating on you for the third time and the action of his living then he confirms our subjective impressions or one might say our hypothesis coincides with the objective and demonstrable facts let us then assume as a hypothesis that the psychopath disorder, the psychopath disorder or his difference from the whole or normal or integrated personality consists of an unawareness and a persistent lack of ability to become aware of what the most important experiences of life means to others. He would need empathy for that. By this is not meant an acceptance of the arbitrarily postulated values of any particular theology, ethics, aesthetics, or ph philosophic system, but that internal, intrinsic, internal biological constitution of right and moral, right? Not necessarily being derived from theology or ethics or aesthetics or ph philosophic systems or any other special set of mores or ideologies, but rather the common substance of emotions or purpose or whatever else one chooses to call it, from which the various ideologies of various groups and various people are formed. Let us assume that this dimension of experience, which gives to all experiences its substance or reality in one into which the psychopath does not enter. Or to be more accurate, let us say he enters, but so superficially that his reality is thin or unsubstantial to the point of being insignificant. But that is what has happened in society because the woman has psychological power. Let us say that despite his otherwise perfect functioning, the major emotional accompaniments are absent or so attenuated as to count for little. Of course, he is unaware of this as everyone is bound, except theoretically, to be unaware of that which is out of his scale, heart, order, or mode of experience. If we grant the existence of a far reaching and persistent blocking, absence or disassociation of this sort, we have all that is needed at the present level of our inquiries to account for the psychopath. The efforts to express what is meant by experiencing life in a full sense or by awareness of a solid emotional contact runs through the psychoanalytic literature, which so often stresses the difference between an actual and an emotionally participating understanding of some important situation and a verbal or academic understanding, however complete in that dimension. This point is also implicit in the conception of psychobiology, 
which by its various definition of terms shows that it is striving to emphasize the wholeness of experience or the full meaning of reaction. Among lay observers of human problems and human values, one sometimes finds sharp awarenesses of the very point and mean to stress in trying to describe the so-called psychopath. A contemporary poet, Donald Parson, chilled by the dead perfection of the celebrated glass flower at How Harvard, seems to see and translate into metaphor and allegory something closely related to the problem of the personalities we hear discuss and whose outer state we describe as a mask of sanctity. This is a poem, apparently, in quotations. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to keep on going. Although to the casual reader, these words may suggest more readily the obvious artificialities of the schizophrenic and the schizophrenic withdrawal of the pain and pleasure of objective life, a point may be made that the full implication of the poem more properly bears on the state of these personalities we now discuss, like the psychopath. Such outward perfections as that seen in the glass flower poem at Harvard and such complete lack of participation in the essence of life and morality suggests wonderfully wonderfully the situation in which we mean to portray in the personality described in this value. The schizophrenic does not perverse the intact outer form and function of a complete personality, but the so-called psychopath does. That's the difference between a psychopath and a schizophrenic. The schizophrenic does not preserve the intact outer forms and functions of a complete personality because it's fragmented, but the so-called psychopath does keep this intact. He does portray in the personality the intact traits of his outer form and functions of his complete personality. Without suffering or enjoying in significant degree the integrated emotional consequences of experience so he can show empathy where the schizophrenic will be disassociated as he's seeing chaos in his face. Somebody gets hit by a car, the schizophrenic will might just stand there and look blankly, emotionally inattentive, but the affect wouldn't be appropriate because he's not showing appropriate emotions to this because he now just lit up a cigarette. Whereas the psychopath could light up the cigarette, but be looking worried and his, look, maybe even show signs of hysteria, right? But he's not actually indeed taking in that complete, I guess, functionings of that per whole person, that complete personality, because he doesn't really feel sorry for that person who just got hit, is what I'm trying to say, even though he's showing the affect of hysteria. Oh my God, somebody, somebody help, somebody call the cops, somebody, somebody, you schizophrenic, call the cops, as a schizophrenic sitting there. <laughs> Apples and bananas. So you see what I mean? So that's the difference between the psychopath and the schizophrenic. <laughs> so he's not really suffering for that person who just got hit. But he was able to cover up his emotions because all of his actions his behaviors are mimic mimicries they call them he he's only mimicking a whole personality uh he's mimicking a deeper level of pers of of awareness through the what he's been learning that you got to show emotions when you see pain in somebody but he doesn't really feel or empathize or really connect with that person's pain, which is why this woman is so frustrated because she's probably dealing with this psychopath just telling her that he love her constantly, but not showing it in his actions. 
he hasn't preserved the in that he even though he's preserving this intact out of form of showing you that I love you, honey. Look at I have a complete personality. I can function in this relationship and for the most part be faithful to you and still mask my psychopathic ideations, though I'm cheating on you and low key hate and despise women. That's a psychopath. He can get away with this because he can keep intact these outer forms of functionings of a complete personality of being sane <laughs> as he's keeping a straight face. But he's not suffering any of your loss as you're crying and having paranoid delusions of him cheating on you because you went into the clinic for a past smear because you thought you had a yeast infection and you really had gonorrhea. How did this happen, occur? As he's telling you he loves you. He'll never cheat on you. No, nah, he ain't feeling your pain, honey. He ain't suffering in it or enjoying in significant degrees and integrated emotional consequences of his experiences with you now, showing him the uh, positive results. Not the psychopath will not learn from it to modify and direct his activities as other men whom we call sane modify and direct theirs. He will lack the real driving impulses which sustain and impel others toward their various widely differing, but at least subjectively important goals. He will, as he's saying, oh, right, now he got to go to this 7-Eleven and get a box of cigarettes and he'll come back for three hours. And you just going to leave me here with my emotions? As he came back and he didn't even open the pack. Already had another pack. This is just for a backup. And it took you three hours? As I'm already good right now. I'm watching Oprah. Stay focused, Cornelius. So he's not coming back to the house, picking up where he's left off with you, to help you deal with your emotions. Now, emotions are why you feel so aggrieved about having gonorrhea. He will lack the real driving impulses, like concern and solicitude for your, for, for your now health. He will naturally lack insight into how he differs from other men who are cheaters and psychopaths. For of course, he does not differ from other men as he sees them. It is entirely impossible for him to see another personality from the aspect of major affective experience since he is blind to these others order. Uh, he's in blind to this order of things or blind to this mode of awareness. So he's is blinded. However, intelligent, he only assumes that other personalities are moved by and experience the ghostly facsimiles of emotions or pseudo emotions known to him. However quick and rational a person he may be, and however subtle and articulate his teacher, he cannot be taught awareness of significance which he fails to feel. He can learn to use the ordinary words and it is very clever, even extraordinarily vivid and eloquent words which signify these matters to other people. And he will learn to reproduce appropriately all the pantomimes of feeling, but as Sheraton said of the desecrated animal, the feeling in itself does not come to pass. <laughs> like he's so sorry now. So that doesn't come to pass now because he's now still going out and leaving you at home with the boy because he's going out with the boy still. You can even wait a, a few days <laughs> to be on your best behavior. You had to run out and go back to your same old routine. Like nothing ever happened as you're still expecting sex from me. Wow. So all of these feelings never came to pass of his real true concern for you 
is real sorry for you and feeling repented. Even this splendid logical faculties will and real life situations produce not actual reasoning, but that limitations of reasoning known as rationalizations. <laughs> but what you expect me to do? I'm a man. Or in the synthesis by which reasoning contributes to sound judgment. The sense of value, that is to say, the value of truth, cannot be missing. When this is missing, one is always dealing with rationalizations, with something which, however technically brilliant, does not satisfactorily guide the shape and shape action. And no difference between the two is more fundamental. When we conceive of the thought, the general psych psychic process and the behavior of a personality in which is postulated. A defect of this, I'm sorry, I gotta stop for a second, take a break. Break, break, break. Oh my God, this is so interesting, guys. Are y'all enjoying yourselves? <laughs> I hope y'all can understand my reading. I'm trying to read it slow. When we conceive of the thought, the general psychic process and the behavior of a personality and whom it postulated a defect of the sort, we have arrived at something identical or at all but identical with the psychopath as he appears in actual life. Let us for the moment refer to that which is missing in the psychopath's response to life as disassociated disassociated instead of using terms that would imply with insistence that it has been dy dynamically repressed or on the other hand, absent through congenital defect. The concept of disassociation is an old one and popularly discarded, but for our present purpose, it may be useful. Let us turn for a moment to other types of psychopathologies in which this concept has at least historically contributed something worthwhile. A familiar example of what we got to talk about disassociation. A familiar example of what is still usually regarded as disassociation is afforded by hysterical sonam sonambulisms, S O M. N A M B U L I S M. And the often cited case, Janet Irene will suffice. This young girl who had sufficed great distress at the death of her mother would, from time to time, go into trace translite state, states in which she ceased abruptly her normal activities and played out a pantomime that's P A N T O. M I M E. This means a dramatic dancing performance in which a story is told by expressive bodily or facial movement mo movements or of a performance. I actually do that sometimes. It's called a pantomime. So this is what this patient Jane did, and what she went into the bed, and what she, in which she went to the bed in which her mother formerly, I'm sorry, there's a spirit messing around with my throat chakra right now. Come here, come on. All 
right, devil. I'm aware of this. So back off. All right, I'll read this all over again. This young girl who had suffered great distress at the death of her mother would from time to time go into a trance-like state during which she ceased abruptly her normal activities and played out a pantomime in which she went from the bed in which her mother formerly lay in illness, rearranged the bed clothes and appeared to be going through the motions of caring for the now dead and absent mother. Having gone through its, this ritual, she returned to her ordinary state and continued the activities which had been interrupted by the somnambulism. A somnambulism is an abnormal condition of sleep in which motor actions are performed. So she apparently was doing this in her sleep. She failed, however, to retain any conscious memory of having performed the ritual at her mother's bed and was, in fact, altogether un unaware of having ceased her ordinary activities. Furthermore, she showed in her usual state of consciousness a surprising forgetfulness about the circumstances connected with her mother's death and a, and a lack, if not a complete absence, of the customary signs of grief. This was surprising in view of her distress at the time of death and in her well-known devotion to her mother. In the trance state, she seemed to have no awareness of her ordinary existence. Briefly, and now he's gonna go into an explanation of this. Briefly, we may say that Irene's experience showed a disassociation in which certain ideas, memories, feelings, all connected with her mother's death or separated from the rest of her personality, disappearing from consciousness, so to speak, and losing their ordinary power to influence thought, feeling, and conduct in the usual manner during the subject ordinary state of being. This split off or disassociated residue of ideas, memories, and feelings on certain occasions forced his way back upon the stage and for a time directed Irene's activities during the somnambulism. This is during her sleep. Here, the disassociated comp component of experience is limited to a small part of the subject's total personality and consists of ideas and memories as well as their accompanying emotions, but only in this somnambulism. The rest of the personality, the ordinary self, we might say, remains not greatly altered or at least plainly recognizable despite the absence from consciousness of the disassociated system. Let it be emphasized that in citing this example and using the term disassociation, there is no implication intended that one is to assume that such a blocking out of material from consciousness occurs by accident or through a lowering of psychic tension due to exhaustion. It could be a regression that split off naturally recreates this in the person. Turning now to schizophrenia, one encounters what might be interpreted as a much more serious and far-reaching disassociation, a a disintegration which results in general fragmentations and splitting ups of an entire ego structure. This disorganization usually extends directly into all aspects of life. The ordinary manifestations of cognitions, active activity, affectivity, and connations being seriously impaired. Due to this thorough demolition of personality, one finds not only impairment in these serious as several, several aspects of functions, but also a striking disparity between ideas and emotions, between the awareness of factors that would make for striving and striving itself. This profound disequilibrium of the whole personality has been aptly termed by Strangely as an intra-psychic ataxia, a T A X I A. Intrapsychic ataxia. Conceiv conceivably, 
based on such an inter underlining state of disintegration. One sees the bizarre and inappropriate reactions, the incongruous affectivity and utterly irrational thought process and absurd conclusions familiar to the advanced case of schizophrenia. Every physician is aware of the fact that those who look with one eye through microscopes or ophthalmoscopes soon find that the other eye, though left open, ceases to see. While attention is directed to what is perceived through the instrument, at what point the stimuli, stimuli to the retina of the unseen eyes are blocked on their way to consciousness or by that, uh, but what means this is done is, whoo, come on. At what point the stimuli to the retina of the unseen eye are blocked on their way to the consciousness or by what means is done is not our immediate concern. This common experience, however, illustrates an, an exception to the organism ordinary response to stimuli. What would become perception if integrated into the response at full consciousness fails to achieve that status and is somehow left out? The question is, is what would become perception if integrated into the response at full consciousness fails to achieve that status and is somehow left out? A simple example of disassociation in the ordinary person is afforded by prejudices. The prejudice may be in sharp conflict and even plainly incompatible with other beliefs or even with the person's general outlook on life or his most cherished principles. Yet it will maintain itself despite rather plain demonstrations of its incompatibility. Here we may say that the prejudice or more properly the cause for having the prejudice is to some degree isolated from the ordinary thinking or logical reasoning, which is why white people can walk around uh, appearing, for the most part, adaptable and tolerable of black people, though they're holding these epithets of white supremacy and racism, allegedly. Is this prejudice? How is they able to cope this or hide this? So their cause of having this prejudice can be hidden from conscious awareness, from their conscious awareness. Uh, and this can be overrided by logical thinking and reasoning, they figured. A disassociation, one might say, has taken place. And in this disassociation, the causal basis for the prejudice has become separated and cannot be reached or dealt with by arguments addressed to the personality of a conscious level. So this is how they had to take it out of the textbooks and school systems so we won't make a causal link to associate prejudice with racism that started in slavery. Just take it out the whole history and sever the whole genetic memory, conscious memory of it, right? So all, it will always account from the previous event. So they can just say Black Lives Matter. It'll start from there. In the psychotic patient, facts may be recognized which conflict vividly with the delusional belief of the patient, yet he will often, while recognizing the conflicting fact, persist in his delusions. That's a conflict fabulation right there. That's the, that's due to left brain hemisphere damage. For instance, the patient may maintain that he is the son of 
Prester John and has lived a thousand years while admittedly free, free, admittedly, admitting freely that he was born in Hoboken in 1923. Our impression of such absurdity is modified if we grant the incompatible belief beliefs belong to different areas of functioning which has lost the ordinary relationship that they would have in an integrated personality and therefore which do not come together or conflict in such a patient or patient's awareness the disassociation we mean to postulate in this other disorder that of the so-called psychopathic personality must be conceived of as different in many respects from that assumed in the examples just cited. Unlike the circumscribed separations of certain past experiences and their accompanying emotions noted in the case of hysteria, let us assume a disassociation extending through a great range of experiences and affecting all the major life reactions of the total personality, we must assume furthermore that this disassociation, unlike that in the schizophrenic, is specific that the outer personality is not chaotically disintegrated, but that only one aspect of experience or one mode of functioning is sh sh shutted out. In the schizophrenic, we find a disassociation which has dis ordered the logical operations of rational processes, which has facilitated the release of powerful and often inappropriate emotional reactions, which has allowed unconscious matter to appear and unconscious as delusions are to be interpreted as objective perceptions of coming from the outer world, which are hallucinations. Such a disassociation at that which we assume is the schizophrenic might be regarded as a general fragmentation of the ego, the process of personality functioning being widely and obviously disordered and the personality structure being somewhat haphazardly wrecked. This is this association which we for the moment assume in the so-called psychopath must not be thought of as a disordering must not be thought of as disordering the outer personality or any part of the surface as we see in affected in the schizophrenic. The cycle, the pathologic process or state we conceive will manifest itself where experiences in, is integrated and will impede or block major affecting responses all through the scale of living from being synthesized into the total unitary reaction. I'm sorry if y'all don't understand this, but I'm gonna keep on reading. Let us think not of a separation or repression of something that has been conscious, but of a specific failure of ordinary effective response to arise and find their way normally into the integrated reactions of the organism. Let us not think of a separation of something that has been conscious, but of a specific failure of ordinary affective responses. So that is the body keeps the score. Trauma is living in the body, but it's fragmented. So the memory can make synapses of beginning, a middle and an end. It can create a conceivable narrative of the event. So it's just living in the body, fragmented, incomprehensible to you. So it cannot reach consciousness, right? So you can't create language for that, which is what the mind needs for conceiving how to now create a solution to get out of the brain being, or the grooves being locked into psychological time of that original stimulus, negative stimulus. This is the separation. of something that has been conscious, but of a specific failure of ordinary really, and that's due to us suppressing and regressing that trauma. That's where ordinary effective responses to arise and find their way normally into the integrated reactions of the organism. 
if an analogy may be permitted, in view of the inherent difficulties and the essential ambiguities of such abstract speculations, one might represent the fragmented personality of the schizophrenic by an apple which has been carved up into multitudinous sections variously and bizarrely shaped and no longer bearing much real resemblance to its original form. In this analogy, the psychopath may be thought of as an apple skillfully peeled, the knife having carefully separated off the skin without altering the shape of the apple except for minor nicks. If one will strenuous, strenuously aid this somewhat far-fetched simile by assuming that the skin of the apple represents those qualities of ordinary human experience which we have assumed to be left out from the general life functionings in the psychopath, the scope and the selectivity of the process as here conceived will be evident. This, this is, he's just using an analogy. <laughs> Still letting the apple skin represents the emotional components or the value aspect of the psychobiologic activity, we may notice in the heat fragments of our schizophrenic apple, this disproportionately large section of skin attached to tiny bits of pulp and vice versa. One may also notice portions of the core lining superficially as well as scattered seeds and all this chaotically disposed in comparisons with the original form and arrangements of the apple. The psychopathic apple, on the other hand, retains its general inner arrangements as well as its form. Indeed, such a peeled apple soon shown a brown discoloration extending over the entire surface, which may on casual inspection be mistaken for the real skin. If skin or peeling carried with it the implications that are strongly inherent in core or kernel, this naive analogy would more naturally embody the conception for which it was chosen. All such attempts to illustrate conceptions of function or process in terms of objects are at best clumsy and many connote absurdities and we seek to avoid. The reader is therefore again reminded that it is a lack in the psychopath's response we refer to an absence of strong customary affective elements and what he experiences in his interactions with his surroundings. Let us leave our analogy. It must of course be granted that the psychopath has some affect. Affect is perhaps a component in the sum of life's reactions even in the uns a unicellular protoplasmic entity. <laughs> Certainly in all mammals, it is obvious. The relatively petty states of pleasure, vexations, animosities, etc., experienced by the psychopath have been mentioned. The opinion here maintains, maintained is that the psychopath fails to know all those more serious and deeply moving affective states which may up the tragedy and triumph of ordinary life, of life at the level of human personality. Such capacities vary widely, of course, among normal people and are perhaps proportionate to the general personality development or in a far-reaching sense to true cultural level. The scope or the sub substantiality of such reactions, if they could be accurately and objectively estimated, would perhaps more than any other criteria enable one to judge how successful and how complete an experiment in nature a particular personality has proved to be. A Beethoven, a Leonardo, or a Achilles would uh, probably present no less a contrast in this aspect with the illiterate peasant or the successful criminal and in an objective of accomplishment. Nevertheless, no normal person is so unevolved, no criminal so generally unresponsive and distorted, but that he seems to experience satisfaction, love, hate, grief, a personal participation in life at human personality levels, 
much more intense and more substantial than the effective reactions of the psychopath. Our concept of psychopath status postulates a selective elimination or blockage which prevents important components of normal experiments, experiences from being integrated into the whole human reaction, particularly an elim elimination or attenuation of those strong effective components that ordinarily arise in major personal and social issues. What term shall we choose for this concept? To stress the general outward indifference and the unpredictable and often incongruous manifestations of effect in the schizophrenic, despite the able operation of rational function in certain fields, the archaic but expressive term emotional dementia has been used. Such a term might also have been applicably to this other and different disorder. A still more appropriate term, however, might be found in somatic dementia with its connotations of a personality so damaged that experience as a whole cannot be grasped or utilized in its ordinary significance or meaning. Since dementia has over several decades progressively acquired implications better to be avoided here, let us think instead of somatic disorders or even of somatic psychosis. Such a term so applied to strengthened in its probable usefulness by heads, familiar concepts of somatic aphasia or a loss of ability to understand the meaning and significance of language, though it's verbal. Oh, that's what uh, Wendy Williams has, this aphasia. It's a loss of ability to understand the meaning and significance of language, though its verbal production is retained, sometimes almost intact, but they don't understand the meaning and significance of the language. Hmm. The patient suffering from somatic aphasia may not only attenuate or in 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 you. Ill, I'm sorry, enunciate words correctly, but he may also speak grammatically and grammatically and produce expressive utterances that seem full of meaning, yet the meaning is beyond his grasp. Sometimes he will leave sentences unfinished and plainly devoid of sentence, remaining unaware of the deficiency. The mechanic of speech are available to him, but he has lost the true use of language, its sign, function, and symbolism. The word and sentences he repeats and initiates means nothing to him. They do not have reference, objective or subjective. They may sound as though they, that they seek to express an underlining thought, but the thought itself is lacking. Such a patient, though he speaks and even perceives the sound as words, cannot formulate anything in language even to himself. So obviously this is a very severe case of, a, uh, of this somatic aphasia. We're not talking about the psychopath right now. It is only the higher or more inward synthesis of perceptions and meanings into language which is destroyed in somatic aphasia. The outer facilities for making language remain, but the product products cannot be utilized or appropriate, appropriated and no significant whole emerges in experience. Somatic aphasia is of course a very different matter from the concept we are seeking to formulate as an inter interpretation of the so-called psychopath. It affords however an analogy which may help make clear the concept which we mean to offer as somatic personality disorder. Just as meaning and the adequate sense of things as a whole are lost in somatic aphasia in the circumscribed field of speech, though the technically mimicry of the language remains intact, in somatic personality disorder, the purposefulness 
of the significance of all life striving and of all subjective experiences are affected without obvious damage to the outer appearance or superficial reactions of the personality. A person undergoing such a biologic change becomes, one might say, more re reflex or more machine-like. What appears to be a whole personality actually is moved by something not quite like full human personality actually is moved by something not quite like full human life. It has been said that a monkey endowed with sufficient longevity would, if he continuously pounded the key of a typewriter, finally strike by pure chance the very successions of keys to produce all the plays of Shakespeare. <laughs> These papers so composed produce all the plays of Shakespeare. These papers so composed in the complete absence of purpose in human awareness would look just as good to any scholar as the actual word works of the bard. Yet we cannot deny that there is a difference. I'm almost finished, guys. This is the last page. Meaning that meaning and life at a prodigiously high level of human value went into one and merely the rule of permutations and combinations into the other. Okay, y'all hear what I just mean? So the meaning and life at a prodigiously high level of human values went into one. Okay, so that's one way of having a high level of human values of meaning in life imposed to the patient somatically imposed to this patient only picking up through machine like mimicry these permutations and combinations on how to behave and that's another way the patient somatically disordered does not of course strike sane and normal attitudes merely by chance his rational power enables him to mimic directly the complex play of human living. Yet what looks like sane realizations and normal experiences remain, in a sense, like the plays of our simian typists. Though outwardly variable and differentiated, simulating all human responses through their vast range, his living in a subjective sense is more mechanical. With the loss of components necessary for adequate evaluation and reactions, a de-differentiation de de of his psychobiologic activity sets in. This is perceptible only on the subjective side, not differently approachable to any examiner and the patient himself by the very fact that he, that it has occurred, cannot perceive it or report it. To use an imperfect but expressive simile, his de differentiation at the core of personality may be compared with the cellular de differentiations of carcinoma. carcinoma. In the latter case, certain epithelial cells, instead of pursuing normal growth, regress to a more primitive activity to an embryonic life process growing widely, losing their specialized purpose and their functional integrations with the rest of the somatic organism, finally invading the body as a whole and destroying its more highly organized sorts, sort of life. So too, in this other pathologic picture, we find that the personality invaded by a mysterious sort of pseudo life, which profoundly distorts our devitalizes experiences and functionings and transforms the self to a pseudo self. Both processes, the neuroplastic and that which disrupts or limits the normal integrative process at somatic level, serve not the scheme of evolving into richer, more intense modes of life experiences, but of withdrawal are sinking to the less vital and less vividly biologic. And that's the end of this chapter. Further discussions of somatic pathologies will be discussed in another video. I think this was pretty 
comprehensive to just read one chapter. Hope all of it made sense on the interpretations of the psychopath. Thank you for listening today and have a wonderful Saturday. Ciao.